Your Excellency, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for millennia, women artists have lived and worked in the shadow of their male peers. They long went unrecognized and unsung. Only in the past couple of centuries have female artists been identified and allowed to have careers of their own. As a result, the particularities of their gender and the inequalities that come with it have consistently featured in their art. If you consider the works of Louise Bourgeois, Niki de saint Phal, or much more recently of Tracy Emin, they have all gone about illustrating one central theme, it's not easy being a woman. What about women in the Muslim world? How have they been portrayed over the ages, and how do they portray themselves? That's the topic of our conversation this morning, and uh, with me are two women who are uniquely and very differently qualified to speak about it. Um, my first guest on the podium is Lala Esaidi. Lala grew up in a prosperous, house, prosperous household in Morocco. Her father had four wives, and she had 11 siblings. When she began studying and practicing art, she discovered Orientalist paintings by such masters as Ingres and Delacroix, in which steamy harems were shown full of reclining and sensual concubines. Of course, neither Ingres nor Delacroix had ever been inside these harems because they were strictly forbidden to them or any other um, male, for, uh, except for the, the, the man in charge. And these paintings, so therefore, were, were pure objects of their imagination and their fantasy. Yet they were paintings that have had a lasting impact on West's image of Eastern women and of the Eastern general. And Lala Asaidi has taken it upon herself to show women as they are in her part of the world. The photographs that you see and the Arabic writing that features on the women's clothing, on the walls, on the faces, on the hands, and in every uh, part of that photograph have been applied by Lala herself. So this is not photo montage. This is Lala actually writing Arabic texts of her own choice um, on the cloth, on you know, the walls on the fabrics and on the faces and hands of the women. And I think the work that you just saw um, with the gold robe is actually made with bullets. So <laughs> there's all kinds of um, symbolism and, and, and all kinds of things going on with, with Lala's art. But so I just wanted to begin, Lala, by asking you, why is it important for you to represent women in your work? I mean, you could have gone on and been a landscape artist, so, or, or... Well, first of all, I would like to say that my relationship to these uh, Orientalist uh, practice is a very complicated one. I am able to appreciate the beauty that these artists were able to, uh, to portray in their art when they visited some of the Arab countries. And at the same time, I really cringe at their representation uh, of mm -hmm. the way of life in the Eastern world and the degrading um, position uh, of the women in their art. So, um, why, when is it, why is it degrading? Well, when these uh, Western artists come to to a world that they don't know, and they portray women as sexual victims and Eastern men as depraved, mm -hmm. then the effect is to actually emasculate Eastern men and to challenge the notion of uh, honor and family. So, um, and the, West, the Western viewers are still seeing Arab women as being oppressed and marginalized. Mm -hmm. when in fact um, they participated in not only in the art but in all other areas. They're, they were significant uh, participants in the dramatic change in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And their art, I think, can help to break down the stereotype and expose people to new perspectives. Um, so what are you trying to say with the beautiful artworks that we're seeing? You are showing women 
um, in what were once real Moroccan harems and old Moroccan palaces, uh, but you're showing them in your way. And, and, and what are you saying with these works that we well, see? Well, uh, first I would like to, I, I'm trying to break the stereotype, but I am an artist and I have to address, um, I have to work in the same way a little bit uh, uh, appropriating the imagery and at least or the style, if you want, of these uh, painters. Uh, it's a big challenge because they were wonderful masters at their crafts and at their skills and it was challenging for me to um, to address something so complicated and so complex and political and at every every level and I'm seeing I I was aware that it was a fantasy all the time and women I knew from the Arab world knew that too because we don't see ourselves in these paintings we are real Arab women but um, so when I went to the West to study, I was more curious to learn about other cultures than my own. And I understood that in order for me to do that, I have to return to my own roots and try to understand my culture better. Because I was coming from a different perspective. So uh, I had an experience. I was still at school and I was still finding my way to find my voice. And I had this encounter with somebody who's qualified to, um, she was a curator, an art historian, she specializes in um, Orientalism, she, and she, she came to my studio and there was a, a very large painter, painting, because I come from a painting background, and yeah. at that time, my first um, uh, exploration and investigation in this uh, Orientalism was through my paintings she came to look at my photographs and she found this huge, large painting of Jérôme in my studio, which is my painting deconstructing the original one from Jérôme. And she Jérôme, was Jérôme de Jean 19, Léon Jérôme, the 19th century French Orientalist painter. And yeah. what happened, she was fascinated by the painting and she wanted to know more about it. And I was explaining, I was excited that someone was interested in what I was doing. And when I finished explaining what I was hoping to do, uh, she turned and she told me that she thought it was real. Every single thing in those paintings were portraying real life in the Eastern world. In the Eastern world. And mm -hmm. I would always thank her for that, because from that moment on, I knew exactly what I needed to do. Interesting. Um, can we... Now move on to our next speaker, who is Turia El Glawi, and many of you knew Tur know Turia because she's the founder of the world's very first art fair devoted to the art of North and Sub-Saharan Africa. It's called 154 for the 54 Nations of Africa, and it takes place at Freeze in New York and London every year. It's coming up soon in New York, so I invite all of you who are in the neighborhood to pay a visit because um, it is really a fair of really quite high caliber, and it's only been around for two, three years. So, um, Turia, that's what Turia does, and that's what she's known for. But she's also here in another capacity. She is the daughter of Hassan El Glawi, who is Morocco's most famous painter, living painter, and who is now a gentleman in his 90s. And we see the depictions of Hassan El Glawi appearing on our screens right now. And he obviously depicted women in his entourage, and his depictions were clearly different from those of the Orientalists, and possibly different also from the ones that Lala produces. And so um, I wanted to ask Turia, how did he approach female subjects in your view? So first of all, he was not allowed to really do that as a career really early on, but he still was so passionate about it that he had his own studio in his uh, mother's home. And I think that the first model that he was able to reach out to, to do this without a proper training, were people from his entourage. So it was his mother, his sisters, his wife, his wife later mom. on, <laughs> and uh, a lot of um, you know the people assisting in the home. Um, and I think that um, besides this very, um, uh, I guess, uh, intimate, you know, surrounding of women, um, there was a lot of um, 
issues around painting or reproducing women in general or even uh, men, you know, at the time, or even, um, you know, any kind of reproduction, let's say. Um, so he went to France and he studied in the Beaux-Arts and he obviously, you know, mastered his craft. Uh, but, you know, he always says to everyone that if you know only his horses, which he's known for, yeah. you don't know his, uh, his art and his paintings because he's really proud of his portraits and uh, his natural mort and landscaping. But it seems that in Morocco, when he came back after um, uh, close to 15 years in France, um, this is not what you know his moroccan audience was um you know willing to appreciate and actually um encourage him to do because i guess there was a whole mixed up also with the religion and you know what you were supposed to reproduce or not so um i think um living in a muslim country was also you know part of the um, the issue why probably his portrait was not as appreciated as uh, as um, as uh, his other other scenes but uh, i have to say women it's quite dear to him because it's always been women he says he loves because it's always been women around around him and um, um, i i um, i do think that he portrayed women of his time i guess you know in many ways mm -hmm. he never tried to portray probably you know the past or but uh, it was always you know part of his um, his surrounding and uh, and the time he was living in. So mm -hmm. uh, the early work you see him was like you know before any training before going to Paris in the Beaux Arts, and it's uh, really people um, that lived in his house or you have portrait of his mother and his sister around him. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel that um, the status of women has has improved or uh, been enhanced? At least in Morocco, I suppose you can speak about Morocco since that's your well, I've, I've always asked this question in very different ways and how yeah. is it uh, to be a woman in the art world, etc. And I have to say I'm quite um, honored to be here today, but I always feel like celebrating women in general in terms of what they do. It's like we're all surprised of that uh, their achievements still, you know. And I think that uh, for me it was not being a Muslim woman that was the challenge. It was just being an entrepreneur, you know, and like trying to do something, something new. I was very lucky to live in the house with an artist father, I guess, who uh, translated my first uh, love for art and, you know, my first art education in Morocco. And um, he was very open and obviously I was surrounded and grew up with portraits of women around my, uh, my home, so... Um, but you were saying also, just to move on to your other hat, which is the 154 Art Fair, mm -hmm. that um, you generally um, have been having an easy time of it because a lot of the gallerists in your fair are women. Exactly. But when you went out looking for sponsors from the African continent, the CEOs, uh, etc., you were talking to were men, and that was a bit more difficult for you. To well, I will never know if the conversation would have been easier if I was a man, so that I wouldn't <laughs> be able... <laughs> I, will, I will never know that, but I do feel like there's some kind of a probably men's club where everything seems to be much easier, you know, than like uh, approaching it as a woman. But the truth is, I think everybody in the room who's in the art world knows how challenging it is to, it is to raise sponsorship or money for the art. And um, I, uh, I'm, I always have a question mark on this one, you know, I don't know yeah. if it would be easier or not. Yeah, we all do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought I'd throw it open because we have about six minutes or so for questions, possibly bit more, if there are any questions from the room. Um, no questions about women artists in the Middle East? <laughs> okay. So we answered everything, was very good. <laughs> Lala, how do you feel, uh, you know, doing the kind of work that you do, how is that re re received by um, the audience in, you know, the Muslim world? I believe at this point it is uh, well received, but at the beginning it was... Um, it was challenging, I must really? say, uh, especially in my country, I would say, more than Why? it has. Um, first of all, I think my family, I come from a very conservative family, and I had a lot of trouble doing my work. Um, uh, at the beginning, it was always in a very secretive way. We would, I photograph at night. We get together a group of women in one of... Uh, the old houses that belong to my family, and we all have that. Um, Can uh, we get some of Lala's images up again? 
if um, possible, of her art. Yeah, there yeah. is one, just I want to say something about one well, image that Eteria. has um, the architecture. It was in a, a harem area in one of the old palaces in Marrakesh, and that palace belonged to Teria's grandfather. That's right. So it was, <laughs> a, it was a very... Um, yeah. Uh, interesting way of finding when I, s I saw that space. I didn't know she was going to be here with me today. Yes, and yes. so seeing that, it's... Uh, so yeah. going back to my practice and the way I, I'm, I have been working at the beginning that made it very, very difficult, um, they were seeing, they were almost saying that I was doing pornographic work because I was working with women. So I have to... I have to do it in such a way that they don't, uh, they don't find out. There was a time, I remember, I was, um, I was shooting one day and I had to have the authority the police guarding the old house to protect me from my family because of the work I was doing, because they didn't understand. They were seeing this group of women together and I was taking pictures and they were questioning the fact that I was showing pictures of women in a Western world and uh, mm -hmm. in their domestic settings. Um, but I think the interesting thing is when my work started being known in the Middle East in here, the people they're looking uh, at as Muslim country, like in Saudi Arabia or, well, I didn't have a show in Saudi Arabia, but they are collectors, but in Dubai, I had, uh, when they saw that and the media started writing about my work, that validated in their eyes. So it's been, it's accepted now in I Morocco. See. I had yeah. uh, many exhibitions. Uh, my work is in the collection of the king himself. People think that it is prestigious and I it see. is and I am honored for that. But the most important for me is that the kind of work I do and it's in the, the collection of the most powerful person in the country who can actually do something to help women. Mm -hmm. So um, fantastic. So it is very well okay. received now. I'm very lucky Great. for mom. Yes, please. We have a question. Before um, before you speak, I have to also open a parenthesis and say that I have a connection to Turi as well, in a funny mm -hmm. sort of way, <laughs> and to her father, because I used to live in Morocco as a child, even though I'm Iranian. And we used to go to the house of a mutual friend of Turia's parents and mine. And this friend had paintings of her father hanging on the wall, including some horse paintings. And so I spent, you know, my childhood looking at the paintings of a man whose daughter is here today. So I just thought... <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, question. Um, good morning, and thank you all for being... In for being here with us and sharing your knowledge. My name is Nancy Mahul and I'm a student. And I'm really curious, my, uh, my question is for artist Lala about your paintings. What kind of text do you use in drawing? Why text and what type of uh, writings do you use? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the text is, is mine, it's my writing and it's my story and the story of the women I work with. And it is, um, it is a feminist strategy to lay claim to the voices of women. And sometimes it's suggested also that women's bodies are constantly overwritten by the discourses of others. So um, it is also written in a, in, a, in a prose which becomes universal. It can apply to every woman. Uh, and uh, I do everything uh, to to make it personal and intimate and yet not being able to access it, for a viewer not to be able to access it. First of all, I'm using the henna and the henna itself when it dries, it's, it becomes, it changes shapes. And I overlay the, the text one on top of the other and when I work I, I, I have to cover a whole big room with fabric and I write on it and then I would take a picture in one place and then the next one in another corner so the text if I write it like this then it's cut and it doesn't have any meaning anymore. But what do the text say? Well it talks about our story and about the women, about our situation, our reflection on our situation as women in the Arab world and how we are portrayed also in the Western orientalist tradition and and 
at the same time, I found that we are now looking forward every year we get together, a group of women, and there's so much changes in them. Mm -hmm. they, they are women who uh, were married before finishing their education. They went back and did the same, because that's what I did too. I was married first, I had my children first, then I went and finished my studies. So um, In it, Boston. <laughs> in Boston, yes. Yeah. And uh, so um, they are also the, the next generation where we're trying to create different memories to the spaces where I work mm -hmm. for them. So um, it's a very, uh, I don't even have word to describe that experience we have. It's, it just became a habit now. Once a year we have to get together. Yeah. I don't know if there are women in the room who are volunteers to pose for uh, <laughs> <laughs> They have to be Moroccan your next session. <laughs> for it, next project. Basically, <laughs> you have to be there all day and uh, not move. Yes. And, uh, and <laughs> Lala, was saying, <laughs> Lala was saying that, yes, um, Lala was saying that um, the, uh, that some of these younger ones are very difficult to, 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 work, with, yeah. to work with because they won't sit still. They're there with their Facebook <laughs> and their you know, Snapchat, you know, and she's trying to have them recline in the harem like the harem orientalists. And, and so there are all kinds of challenges. Right. Yes, please, I Your wanted, Excellency. I wanted, no. to ask, I wanted to ask both of you, right. what do you feel is the price you have paid as women to become artists as you have? Did you have to go through, you just alluded to it briefly, that you had married, you had your family before you could go on with your art. And I would like to know from you, also, what all women pay a price in our society. It doesn't matter if it's East or West, Christian, Islamist, but it doesn't matter. We all pay a price for being women in this time. So what price did you pay? <coughs> um. Do you want to Toria, do you want to take that yeah. first, even though you're not an artist, but you can still answer? Yeah, uh, exactly. I was going to say, I mean, honestly, I didn't think um, I paid the price. Maybe I was very privileged uh, to have very open parents and uh, that sent me to school very early outside. Um, I would love to answer, answer this. I had to work really hard like anybody else to make a career. Um, I don't think I paid a harder price than anybody else. And maybe thanks to my parents, maybe thanks to the surrounding, the privilege, I don't know, but uh, it would be unfair to say that I have suffered in any kind of way to be where I am today. Lala, what about you? What in price have you paid? In my case also, at the beginning, it was, uh, it was difficult. And um, I knew it was going to be difficult because um, we live in a <coughs> society that has long-standing uh, traditions and um, cultural, and it's, so it's, it, it was difficult for me because I, I came with that idea that I'm going to be facing a lot of problems. But eventually everything fell into place. And I have been also privileged that my work been accepted. There is a dialogue I was hoping for to have a dialogue and it's happening. And uh, women that I work with, they are really benefiting from what we're doing together. And for me, that's a blessing. Your Excellency, go ahead. I please. had a, just a technical, are you both based in Marrakesh? Uh, no, I'm based in London, and um, I'm based in New York and Marrakesh. Probably. Okay, <laughs> because you know Marrakesh has is really grown over the past right. years with the art market mm -hmm. and the Biennale, and you know there's a lot of European collectors who are there. I was just curious to see, do you find that your collectors are predominantly in the West or Arab collectors? Okay, so for the fair is a bit different. So 90% I'll sell the collectors. I'm benefiting from the collectors from freeze. So the, I'm leveraging from the international collector base. I'll say that I probably have like 10% of my collector coming from the continent. When it comes to Marrakesh, it's so happening that our next edition of 154 is happening there in 2018, February 2018. Um, I'm a part also of the board of the Biennale of Marrakesh. So I mean, I completely agree with you. And this is a, a really happening place at the, at the moment movement for the art. Um, I'm going back and forth. My family lives in Rabat, so I have to, to be there quite a lot, and quite a lot in New York as well for the fair in New York, but um, uh, I didn't really choose it. My path took me, you know, to live in London after New York. I mean, that's, uh, that's all. One day I'll go back to Morocco probably, you know. 
What about you, Lala? Yeah. In my case, I spent a long period of time in Morocco because I have more access to women. I have a group of Moroccan women in Boston also I work with, but um, I spend more time now in, Mor uh, in Morocco because I feel that I was removed from the culture I was working with, and I was, so I needed to be, to be there. And uh, I have a quite a group of um, collectors, and equally Moroccans and Western who live in Morocco. The thing I found interesting is what, when they come, the, the Western people, when they collect my work in Morocco, and they collect all Moroccan uh, work, their collection, they have literally no other artists except from Morocco. So I always found that, um, interesting, but at the same time, they are not considering um, Moroccan art as being good enough to be somewhere else, so they're collecting just Moroccan artists. And, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming really interesting to be in Morocco at this time. So, thank yes, you. please. Can you wait for the microphone? It's coming. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, it's particularly a question uh, for Lala, actually. Have you had an opportunity to place your works beside the likes of uh, Jerome and Delacroix with Western collections? Because these are iconic images that are in Western consciousness. So have you had a chance to interrogate them side by side? Would you welcome that? Would the collections in the West welcome that? I'd just be intrigued to know. And Toria, possibly also with your artists, have you had a chance to, to do this? Thank you. I actually, one of my first museum exhibition was uh, in the Williams uh, Museum, and it is closer to the Clark, where they have the major Orientalist collection. And I had the privilege to, um, to have the painting on my own. They were um, getting it ready, and I was invited to have an exhibition with the Orientalist painting at the same time, but it was with painting at that moment. And uh, it was really very interesting for me. It was, um, uh, it was a major thing in my career, I think. It just took me even further. I have been invited to do another show with uh, Orientalists, and it was supposed to be here, and I think it was postponed because the Orientalist Museum wasn't ready. and. Uh, <laughs> Soon. Soon it that, uh, yes, it was really. In, I was very looking forward to it because, because of the context you're talking about, having my work alongside these Orientalist painting that inspired my work and uh, marked me so much would be uh, really something I, I would appreciate very much. Thank you, Your Highness. <laughs> I had one last question. Who are these women that you bring in to do the art works on? I mean, the, especially the young ones. Who are these young they ones? Are, I work only with family members right. and friends. And uh, it's a collaboration because I have to inform them of what I'm doing. When I go to photograph, I prepare. The per preparation takes months and sometimes years. There's one. Um, one picture there that the, she's wearing the cape made of the bullet casting that took me one year to weave. The so, bullet cases, uh, yes. Yeah. And the writing too takes very long. Because but who I are the girls? The girls are all from my family. And so they're uh, 18, family from, 20, 16? No, they're always uh, 20 and uh, higher. Yeah, I, I can't. There were, so there, I have a niece that she's she wants to be in the picture. She's waiting every year. When? <laughs> every year. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so one of the reasons I was talking about the changes in the life of these women is one of my models, she became a top model in the state right now mm -hmm. and in Europe. Uh, she, they just also look up at me that in my age, we, uh, going back to school and having a career, so I become an example like for them. Like a role model. Yes, so it, it, it's, yeah. it really makes me happy to see that my work can do that for these women. Well, I think you're both role models, so thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.